So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Ian from University of Reading, who's going to talk about neural recording. Thanks, Ian. <laughs> thank you very much for coming, and thank you for having me here. Um, neural recording, in fact, today, we, it's our experimental day. So I only just came to here from my lab, and we, all day from 9 o'clock, we've been doing neural recording. Until, so I, I left about quarter to 8, and my uh, colleague is Mike. As I speak, he's still doing neural recording. And this is the kind of data that we record um, neural signal. And the, um, the parameters of the recording is like we record at 25 kilohertz, and we have 16 channels plus one time. So I have to go for 17 channels. And uh, uh, we have trials, each trial 25 seconds, and we have 55 trials, and we do six runs. So all together, our data at the end of the day is about that many data points we have to process. And um, usually, when I, I, I'm not a, a computer scientist, so I don't really know how to, com how to convert these data points to how many gigabytes, but I know usually we have like 25 gigabytes of data at the end of the day. But this is parameter. If you're interested in this, well, we can probably discuss it later on. However, I thought I'm not going to talk about how we recorded data, but instead I'm going to focus on what it is that we're recording. What do we mean by neural signals? You know, what do they represent? And the implication of that and how we interpret these neural signals. So that is uh, going to be the focus of my talk. And I prepared it. Um, so that um, it is not, uh, I hope, at a very kind of academic level. I just want to just almost like a chat. And um, I only prepared 15 slides, so hopefully we won't, uh, it won't take very long to run. Um, right. The, generally, when we're talking about, when, when I say uh, neural recordings, I, I assume that most of you think of it probably the, 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 the common neural signals you probably know is like EEG signals. And you, can see, you, you probably also heard uh, sort of like EEG, sort of like a kind of a game, right? Using uh, sort of like EEG head or some kind of cup, and then you can play kind of mind games. So people are usually talking about that kind of neural signal. So EEG is a type of neural recording. And we can have an EEG signal in humans, like wired, or, um, um, in fact, my friend, my collaborator, developed this um, uh, rodent cap, and then re EEG recording, and you can record it, you can put it on the rat's hat, um, uh, head and record a neural signal, EEG signal as well. And those are wired ones, so you can't, the, the subject can't move about. And, and I think a technology has now been developed, so you can have wireless ones. So this is a kind of based on kind of EEG recording because you have probed on, on the scalp um, of the head. And you, you know, uh, can have wireless uh, EEG recordings in animals as well. And that's been uh, developed quite well as well. Oops, I used the two fingers. Right, okay. Right, so. EEG signal, if we look at what the EEG signal is actually recording, um, you probably have um, heard spontaneous EEG recording um, e or brain rhythms at different frequencies. So these are kind of well-known brain rhythms. For example, delta rhythm, and you, uh, that is usually recorded um, when you are sleeping. And theta rhythm, um, when you're drowsy, and that signal usually um, it's a, can be recorded in EEG. And they have a different frequency bands. Here's low frequency, and then here we have 4 to 7 hertz. And the next band is called alpha band. That's probably the well-known kind of signal, alpha rhythm, where it's, it's about 8 to 12 hertz. And that is when you are... Um, not sleeping, but you are relaxing, and particularly if you have your eyes closed. As soon as you have your eyes closed, you have this alpha signal in the, in the EEG, and primarily in the occipital, lobe, in, the, in the visual cortex at the back of, the, of, the, of your head. Um, and you can have 
The next band is called beta band, uh, beta wave, and that is when you're actively thinking about something. And that's so, and last one, gamma. Gamma frequency is a high frequency, 25 to 100 hertz. And that is when you are highly alert, so or you are really focused on doing something in there. Um, so you'll find a, a gamma uh, wave in the EEG. Um, these are actually sort of spontaneous activities. They are not in response to a particular stimulus. So you can be just relaxing there, and your EEG will show those rhythms. Um, but also, there are evoked, sensory evoked responses that EEG can record. For example, if you have a, a, a visual stimulus, so checkerboard flash, and, and EEG would record in the visual cortex, because vi, um, visual evoked potential, um, it would record a signal, something like that. So the signal, the EEG signal will go up and down, up and down, and then it stops. And the, the time <coughs> is probably round about a, sort of like start responding around the, after maybe 50 milliseconds. And uh, there are signals that people call it like P100, P means there's a positive deflection and it occurs at 100 milliseconds after the stimulus onset, etc. Or if you record, if you um, play a sound at a particular frequency and people can record the EEG in the uh, auditory cortex and they are called the auditory evoked potential. And that the signal look kind of similar to the visual evoked potential. And you can also do somatosensory, you recall somatosensory evoked potential. Um, th in this particular case, you have, uh, I don't know whether you heard TMS, it's a, it's a shape eight, a shape like eight, like a magnet or something. And you, you zap it to your head and then your finger moves or your leg moves or something. And, and then when they record EEG, and you will see that this is a somatosensory evoked potential. And again, you have positive deflections and negative deflections. So these are EEG signals recorded during an evoked activity in response to a, to a stimulus. Um, these are all very good, but the question is how, why? Why do you get these signals, positive, negative? Why do you, you know, why is it not uh, sinusoidal or why is it not whatever? Why, is, why do you get these reflections? And what is more important, what caused them? Because if you understand those positive and negative deflections, maybe you could interpret the signal better. So EEG signal interpretation, interpretation at the moment, at this um, time in the development, the EEG interpretation is really at its infancy. People don't quite understand what these positive and negative deflections are. The reason it's quite important um, is that, that to understand those deflections is um, EEG is non-invasive and you can easily do it in humans. They're reasonably cheap. However, if you record a signal, for example, in this case, you record some kind of a visual evoked potential, you record it in control subjects without the, uh, any disease, and then say you record in a group subject that may have disease or potentially develop disease, in this case, people uh, at risk of Alzheimer's, and then you compare the EEG signals of the two groups, and you find that there's a difference, and the difference is like this. So as a, if you are a doctor, you say, right, there is a difference, but I don't really understand why this difference and how I'm going to interpret, how I'm going to treat my patients. I can only say that EEG gives me a difference. So there's a difference between two groups. So it's quite important that we, if we could understand what, what these defections are, we will be able to hopefully develop an EEG as a, a diagnosis tool or, or, you know, and develop drugs, etc. So, so the real question is, you know, th this is a neural signal. How do we interpret this result? And it has important implications on this treatment. Um, so in order to understand those EEG signals, we are um, we developed, uh, we, we are using 
an animal model. The reason we use an animal model is EEG is non-invasive, but we can't do a lot of, and, and you, you can apply it to in, in humans, but we can't do a lot of manipulations because there are ethical issues. Um, we can, however, develop, use an animal model, and we could use invasive recordings. And hopefully, and we can also do manipulations with drugs, etc. And hopefully, by doing this, we understand those invasive neural signals, and we can relate them to EEG. Then we may, be, we may have hope in interpreting EEG signals. So the model we use is a, a, a rat model, and we use whisker stimulation. That's what the kind of experiment that I, I was doing today. Uh, we basically stimulate the, the whisker pad of a rat, and we record the, this is the barrel cortex, we record the neural signal from the um, barrel cortex, and then we do something hopefully clever. Um, we record using microelectrodes. So these are really, compared with EEG, they are tiny, and this is the dimension. So at the tip of the microelectrode, uh, we have 16 channels. They, they are probes and of area about 177 micrometers squared, and the distance between them is 100 uh, micrometers, and they're very, very, very fine. I usually can't see them. <laughs> So we have uh, microscopes, etc. So what we do with those micro, um, uh, elect uh, micro electrodes is we insert it into the uh, barrel cortex of rat. So the barrel cortex is about here, and just very briefly, the rat barrel cortex has about six layers, and each layer has um, different distribution of neurons, and they do different things. And in particular, layer four, which is this kind of dark air layer, that layer four is like an input layer, and it receives a lot of signal from uh, deep brain structures like uh, thalamus, and then it then talk to other layers like layer two or layer one, and it also talk to other um, re regions of the brain. So what we do is that we insert an electrode, the microelectrode, into the barrel cortex, and we record neural activity. So here, right, the neural activity with us. That's, that's basically what we're recording, right? So we have 16 channels, and you can see very positive deflections and there are negative deflections, and these are called local field potentials, LFP. Now, the question now here is you say, okay, these if I don't, I don't understand what EEG positive and negative deflections are. I also don't understand what this, what this, why is it we have positive ones, we have negative ones. What, what are they related to in terms of related to neural activity? So in order to understand that, we have to go even a little bit, zoom in a little bit more to see what other people did at a single neuron level. And that, because local field potential record the population of neurons, and they are about 177 the probe is about 177 micrometers squared, micrometer squared. So compared with single neurons, which are usually a couple of microns, they are actually quite large. So they actually record a population of neurons. So in order to understand that signal, we went back to see what other people recording at single uh, neuron level. And this is a typical pyramidal neuron. And it looks a bit like a tree. So these are dendrites. This is apical dendrite, and then here are some uh, basal dendrite and, uh, and, uh, and some exons. Um, if you look at the neuron, a uh, uh, small section of it along its apical dendrite, and you zoom it in, you will actually see these are the same thing, that they are not smooth. They have these, these boutons. And these boutons, these nice pictures of those boutons, and these are synapses. And they are the where, they are where they talk to the presynaptic neurons. So that's how information is transmitted from the one neuron to the other. And so here you can see, see this is how, um, this is a, a, a synapse, a synapse, this is the, here, this is the boton of this, uh, maybe this neuron, and then this is the presynaptic uh, 
neuron, and they actually information exchange here by neurotransmitters um, and uh, etc. And and here is another neuron that is a synapse. So it's, this is a single synapse where the presynaptic uh, neuron uh, uh, release neurotransmitters, and then uh, the postsynaptic uh, uh, neuron open channels and uh, receive information like that. And here you can see this synapse has actually two synapses, this proton, one there and one there, and it can release different uh, neurotransmitters. So that, that is how neurons kind of talk to each other and transmit information. If I zoom it in a little bit more on even a, a, a small section of, of a, 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 a dendrite, and I'm just, this is purely graphical illustration of what's going on. You will see that those, some of those boutons or those synapses are excitatory ones. So those are the ones in green. And some are inhibitory ones, and those are in red. And those ones that are green, the excitatory ones, what happens is when these, oh, these synapses open, open up, okay, outside there are positive ions and negative ions. The positive ones are like sodium ions and they carry positive charge, and the negative ones are like chloride and negative charge. And when those pos when these excitatory synapses open, it's like a gate open, they only allow positive um, ions to go in. They don't allow negative ones to go in. So when they open, those positive ions go in, into the, into the uh, uh, neuron, and that raises the uh, uh, membrane potential of the neuron inside, but on the outside, it actually, there is a decrease in the field potential because, it, because all the positive ions are gone inside. So, so where at rest, local field potential you record is a kind of uh, nearly not very much. When the excitatory synapse is open, the local field potential actually, because it's outside, this is micro, uh, micro electrode probe, this is our, it's actually much bigger than that. Okay. But when the excitatory synapse is open, this probe actually records a decrease in local field potential. And <clears throat> similarly, if the inhibitory synapse is open, they only attract, only allow negative ions to go in, so that the membrane potential inside of the cell decreases, so that it's actually hyperpolarized. And the, um, the, the microelectrode probe will record an increase in the field potential, an increase like that, yeah? Because there are less negative ions outside, they all gone in. So, so, so what we see is that if we could make the only excitatory synapses open, local field potential would record a negative bump. And if we could only make the in inhibitory synapse open, it would record a positive bump. But obviously, when brain works normally, they open and shut with some rules. And what are these rules? And these rules decide the local field potential shape. So, these guys, Oaken and Lamb, they actually, there, there are a lot of other scientists before them, but this particular paper was interesting, and that they actually try to find the rules of how the excitatory and the inhibitory synapses open and shut, and, and the, 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 in time, what the rules are. So what they did was they actually did a clamp recording. Well, um, I don't know whether you know about clamp recording. So they actually record single neurons, but they clamp it at a particular potential. So when you clamp it at a potential that is quite low, what happens is when you only see positive, you only see excitatory synapses activity. You don't really see inhibitory ones. And when you clamp the neuron at very high potential, you only then see excitatory activities, you don't really see inhibitory ones. So what they did, they, they simultaneously clamped two neurons next to each other, very, very close to each other. They simultaneously clamped it, one at a low potential, one at a high potential. And then they just record the neural activity. This time it's a membrane, the membrane activity. And what they found was that the, the two neurons, neural activity are actually highly correlated not only that, the excitatory activity statistically leads inhibitory 
activity by a few milliseconds. So the results, what they see is that the excitatory inhibitory synaptic channel activities co-tune. So if one is big, the other is also big. If one is small, the other is also small. It's not like one is big, the other like that, and one is small. So they're not doing this, they're doing like a lift. They're going up and down kind of together, but not exactly together. Inhibitory activity lags excitatory activity by a few milliseconds. So that is really very interesting because it gives us a means of setting a hypothesis to test about new, uh, local field potential because the hypothesis that we're testing at the moment is that local field potential, which is this black line curve, local field potential is the sum of the excitatory activity of the neural population and the inhibitory activity of the neural population. And particularly, because inhibition lags excitation, the initial segment of the local field potential, the evoked local field potential, is probably only related to excitation. It's not related to inhibition, because inhibition hasn't even opened up. Not only that, the peak of this local field potential is really dependent on when inhibition comes in. So if inhibition comes in late, you would have a large peak, and also latency will probably, with that peak latency would be longer. And if inhibition comes in very fast, you would have a smaller peak and probably um, a, a shorter latency. So we say, why don't we test to see whether or not this is R before we do the test? The reason this, this hypothesis I... Um, I kind of thought of it, but the, one of the reasons I thought about it is because I went on Wikipedia. I said, what's the relationship between excitation and inhibition? And if you go on Wikipedia in inhibitory synaptic potential, you would see a figure like that. And that is what most people understand, the excitation inhibition. And what they're saying is you have excitatory ones, so they, they, they are plotting the membrane potential, not the field potential. That's why it's the other way around, because membrane potential and field potential is is opposite each other. So they say the field potential or the potential, the membrane potential you see is basically excitatory ones minus inhibitory ones. And they are completely coincide with each other like this. So that you get, so you have two of these and then they disappear. So if, if you have them completely identical, let's say, you would see nothing. But if you use this, even if they're identical, if you shift it, you still see something. So we say, OK, let's see whether we could test this to see whether the local field potential is generated by the, ex by the shifted excitation inhibition. So our experiment, actually, we said, OK, what can we do? So we injected bicuculin, which is a, a drug, to block excitatory channels, basically stop it from opening or stop part of it from opening. Um, and so we use, this is infusion electrode, and the, it infuses the drug can, can uh, come out of the end there. And then we just insert it into the, into the cortex. And then we say, OK, what would we expect if this hypothesis is true? We, what, what we would expect would be that if we could get rid of inhibition, then our local field potential would look a little bit like the excitation. That black one should then look a little bit green one. And if we get rid of it more, uh, uh, if we decrease the amount of drug, then it would, the curve would gradually return to the original one when um, the, under the normal condition. And here is what we got. This, is, uh, this data we actually collected um, just last year. Um, that we see that from channel nine, we have 16 channels. So channel nine is roughly kind of a layer four. And what we see is here is the data that, um, right, the local field potential data. And what we see is the control local field potential has no bacuculi. So this is the blue one here. And when we inject bacuculi into the brain, and we actually get the yellow one is the local field potential. And as we decrease the dosage, as we gradually decrease dosage, and the local field potential gradually decreases, decreases. And after a long period of time, usually about 50, maybe 20, 20 minutes or something, 
it maybe yeah maybe 10, 10 20 minutes it would kind of return to the control uh, local field potential so what we see we importantly what we see is that the initial segment of the local field potential stay the same no matter how many uh, how much dosage you put in to the bicycling how much bicycling you put in the initial slope remain roughly the same and also the peak the peak of the local field potential becomes bigger if you put a lot of bicycling in and it's more delayed the latency is longer as well so that seemed to suggest that our hypothesis is true. And we also looked at the top local field potential channel. Why do we want to look at the top channel? Because the top channel is kind of very similar to EEG. Because EEG is on the scope, and the difference is this one is actually just between, just on the top surface of the uh, cerebral cortex, the barrel cortex. So we Look at that, and exactly the same thing. We found that the control uh, uh, field potential has, is, is blue, is that no bicycling. And then when we put bicycling in, we see a much broader uh, field potential here. And as bicycling dosage decreases, and that <coughs> broadening decreases as well. And particularly, it, uh, interestingly, the initial segment of the local field potential is entirely independent of inhibition. So this bit is really to do with the excitation um, only. And again, the latency of the local field potential is uh, um, increases as we uh, in, in inject by quickly. Okay, so this is nearly the last one. So the question, so this is, we're still doing experiments. We have done about eight. We have collected eight data sets, and, uh, and so we're going to uh, probably write it up. But the question would be, from animal study, are we any wiser in terms of interpreting EEG signal? I think we probably a little bit wiser at this stage, and hopefully we can design more experiments to actually tease out all the other uh, deflections. So here, we, what we would say probably, I, I will be very cautious because um, we haven't done the concurrent EEG and local field potential recording. And that is really a crucial thread. That's what we're going to do next. So once we've done that, we probably can say for certain. But at the moment, my speculation would be that possibly the initial segment of EEG is only related to excitation of the local neural population. And maybe the negative deflection there, how big it is and how uh, latent it is, it probably depending on how effective the inhibitory synaptic uh, potential are. So therefore, if uh, you um, say, if, if, the, uh, if the initial segment in your control group be change between control and the patient uh, groups, if the initial segment change, it might kind of imply that the, the, the excitatory uh, channels have uh, uh, kind of have problems or abnormal compared with controls. But if they stay the same, and then you have a, sort of like a, a peak changes in the, here, it might imply some kind of um, illness in the, in the, it's just some abnormality or whatever in the, in the inhibitory channels. Um, if you ask about all the other deflections, we still need to design more experiments in order to investigate what they are related to. But I think we are just at the beginning of trying to understand what EEG neural recording mean in terms of neural excitation inhibition. Okay. And here are my um, people, uh, my collaborators, and my, my uh, postdocs, Mike and Jinjin. They, they were fantastic at doing all of the experiments. And here are just some questions. Thank you.